introduce myself because everybody knows me. So, <laughs> our gallery manager, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. and, everybody knows me. <laughs> and we've got Rachel. So, anyway, um, this, we've got uh, dual exhibitions today. Um, and um, Miro, of course, has always been one of my favorite artists and it has influenced me as an artist. And, um, and then the Mexican Surrealist Show um, in 1992, I was in Mexico City. And um, I've always been interested in Central American artists and Latin American artists. And so um, it's a, a special personal significance to me because I thought of myself as an artist since I'm five or six years old. And uh, when I left UWM, um, so after I was studying there, history and uh, fine arts, um, I stopped painting for 20 years because um, I didn't have classes that I had to produce artwork for, and I was trying to get the gallery going. And so, but um, when I came back from Mexico City, that experience, the culture, the people, the history, um, the artists, everything about it, uh, inspired me so much that I started painting again. And so, this little piece here, um, is the first, uh, it's a variation of the first piece I did after um, an absence of painting for 20 years. It's called <clears throat> First Impressions of Mexico City, number one, and um, in Spanish, una, una Pata Arriba Revisited. So I only had two years of high school Spanish, so forgive me if my accent is <laughs> hard to interpret, but it means one leg up. And um, so uh, inspirations, as you know, um, come in many strange ways. And this particular piece, I was in a cab and uh, we were on our way to Miguel Castro Nero's studio, myself, and um, Hector was a Puerto Rican uh, dealer from Chicago who I took with me because he, he had been to Mexico City many times before and knew quite a few of the artists. And so he, he introduced me. To Miguel and some of the other artists. And anyway, so we're on our way to his studio, and of course, Mexico City has tremendous traffic problems and pollution problems. Um, what big city does it, right? So, anyway, so we're in this cab, VW uh, Beetle, and in the car next to us, there was a young lady, and um, her radio was blasting. I can't remember what the music was. But she had her left leg out the driver's side window, and she, you know, just having having fun. So we started a conversation with her. Turned out she was an American woman, and she was on her way to the gymnasium. And anyway, so I said to, to Hector, I said, "How do you say one leg up?" And he said, "Una patrida." So for some reason, I came up with this uh, self-portrait that's me dying from the exhaust from all of that pollution. Oh, and, um, but, um, you know, out of difficult experiences comes some amazing things, at least to me it's amazing, so, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so, and, um, anyway, so, that's my story for today, and I'll turn it over to Rachel. All right, so, since there's only five of you, if you want to make this more of a conversation, if you want to ask questions while I'm talking, feel free to do so. It's very informal, uh, there's only five of you, but we can make this fun if you'd like. So, um, to start off, we're going to be talking about Mexican Surrealism, so the show in this room, and I'm going to be discussing um, an introduction to Surrealism, what these artists were inspired by, and how Mexico's brand of Surrealism is a little bit different, a little more um, it's unique from European Surrealism. And then after we go through this, we're going to move out into that room to discuss Miro's uh, personal language, his personal symbols, and how one might read into those or not, if you choose not to. So to start, we'll talk a little bit about what Surrealism was at its beginnings. Um, so Surrealism as a movement began in the 1920s. It was popularized in Paris and started majorly with the influence of psychoanalysis and Sigmund Freud. So because of his, his theories of the unconscious mind, artists were starting to realize that there was more to a situation than might meet the eye. So they were starting to dig deeper into what 
their unconscious mind, what an altered mind might think about a situation or a person or um, an event, and they started to create art that reflected another part of the human mind. Surrealism and surrealist artists were also inspired by a different art movement called Dada that was happening slightly earlier than surrealism, um, kind of around the start of World War I, so 1913-1914. And what Dada was, was, was kind of like an anti-art art movement. So they were trying to do really crazy, absurd things with um, materials that you would never expect, like trash that they find on the side of the road. Um, they were also really interested in just randomness and chance and anything that would really shock and surprise an art viewer that was used to beautiful paintings or even like early modern sketches of people doing the things in the cafe. Even that was like old hat to these Dadaist artists. <coughs> So surrealism really took the anti-rationalism that was so prevalent in Dada artwork and they took that and they ran with it in sort of a different direction. Um, they were still using some of the traditions of artwork up to this point, but they were also realizing that they could do whatever they want. So Dada kind of broke open the walls for them and they realized that they could do basically whatever they wanted with their art. They could express themselves and come up with these crazy absurd ideas and if, hey, if the Dadas could do this, then we can do what we want with our dreams and our art. So something, a new technique that came out of surrealism is a technique called automatic drawing. Um, this was something that surrealist artists used to sort of tap into their unconscious mind and free themselves from any sort of restraint based on what the art world wants them to do. So essentially what they would do is they would take like a pencil or a paintbrush or any of their tools and they would kind of just like freely draw and not think about what they're trying to make. They would just make marks and just let their brain go without thinking about it at all. And so this was kind of one side of the surrealist movement. They were into like automatic unconscious total animal brain type artwork. And then others were really interested in sort of unnerving scenes that you might get with free association or something that you might see in a dream. And an artist like that would be Sandra Dali. So his artwork is really not automatic at all. He's very meticulous. His artwork is very detail oriented, um, almost realistic except for the fact that everything going on in the scene is totally crazy and it would never happen in the real world. So these artists were looking at different ways to explore what was in the unconscious mind or even a mind that was, say, under the influence of drugs or alcohol or even a mind that was altered in the state of being four or three years old. So they were interested in childlike artwork as well. Um, the surrealists were also in, interested in other aspects of art making and life as well. So it wasn't just a painting or a drawing movement, it was also a movement in poetry and writing and performance and theater and even a lot of these artists were very political in their artwork. So um, the movement was started by an artist named Andre Breton and he actually started the surrealists as a group by writing a manifesto. So Breton was mostly a writer. He did some artwork, but he did a lot of his surrealist writing, or he did a lot of his surrealist creation in poetry and essays and books and novels and stuff like that. So this group, um, it was united by Breton's manifesto, kind of declaring their rules and their aims, their desire to break apart what art was and kind of let the unconscious mind free. Um, but the interesting thing about surrealism is that instead of it being united by a technique of art making, such as the Dadas were kind of just using all crazy materials to do whatever they wanted, um, surrealism produced lots of different artists with lots of different techniques and visions, but they were all united under the philosophy of exploring the unconscious and the unusual, the, um, like the dreamlike in their artwork. So that's where we get all of these different artists, all these different techniques to create a really wide-ranging but still somehow specific art movement. So as I said before, Mexico, what makes Mexico unique in their surrealism is their blend of the mythological and the traditional and the modern and new, especially in the artwork that was brought there. 
So Mexico's brand of surrealism, as far as I could see in my research, it was less bound by the idea of an automatic unconscious, but more of a grounded and distorted view of the world as influenced by these myths. So um, even the European surrealists realized this, and some of them wrote about it or spoke about it. Um, Andre Breton, who was the creator of the surrealist movement, said that Mexico had preserved its mythological past in its modern artwork. And Salvador Dali was also quoted saying, there's no way I'm going back to Mexico. I can't stand to be in a country that is more surrealist than my paintings. <laughs> so even Salvador Dali, he realized that this country was just way too, too surreal for him, and he thought that it would supplant his own crazy dreamlike paintings. 